when you are sorrowful for your people. Thank you for being a God that can be touched with our infirmities. Thank you, oh God, for being the advocate, for being the one that stands between God and man. Jesus, the intercessor, thank you for your posture, for your sacrifice, for going before us to make the crooked places straight. Thank you, oh God, for being faithful. For you are a faithful God. And you are trustworthy, Messiah. And you never fail, Ramasoko Dadabaya. Hey, you never lost a battle, Shandora Messiah. You've never lost a battle, Mandora Ramase. You've never lost a battle, Shandora Messiah. You've never lost a battle, Shandora Messiah. So we give you the praise. comfort oh God we receive your comfort oh God we receive your comfort oh God we receive your comfort you're making our deserts filled with streams oh you're making our wilderness and Eden it's in your comfort. Who tell my soul? in peace embassy we are your hosts for today elders brian and khadijah weathersby on behalf of bishop and pastor Lita, we want to welcome you here today if you're watching via live stream please remember to like share and subscribe and if you're in the building and if you have any questions please see one of our guest services team members or our security team so you know um our friends know that we're sports parents and we 
jokingly call ourselves the captain and co-captain of Team Weathersby, right? We've got multiple children that play multiple sports, so that means we're busy all year long. And a group of us sports parents were talking, and we were saying, like, you got to be built different to be a sports parent. And right now we're in football season, so... We got a high school senior that practices that doesn't drive, so we gotta take him to practice, pick him up for practice. And then we've got our girls who cheer on two different levels. And they practice every single day. So you've gotta be, you know, you gotta be built real different. You gotta be able to move on a dime. And I kinda liken that to being in the kingdom, right? You gotta be built different, right? Even when we don't, you know, we're tired and we don't feel like it or we've got something that we deem better to do than take the kids to practice or sit with them at practice or be at a game all day Saturday from sun up to sundown. No matter how I feel, I have to show up, right? So in the kingdom, it's the same thing. I have to show up no matter what's going on in my life, no matter how I feel, I've got to show up for the people that I serve. And the people that I serve are the people of the kingdom, right? Not just the people in here, but the people out there. So I'm taking both of my worlds because I'm built different. I'm built different here and I'm built different there. I'm ministering what I minister here, there on the football field or on the basketball court or on the cheerleading sidelines or in the stands with the parents. So I just want to encourage you to be built different. Man, let us pray. Father God, we come to you thanking you for yet another day. But yet another opportunity, God, to come in this place, God. God, you brought us together today, and it's not by accident, God. It is by your divine order, God. And we declare on today, that God, that we are not ashamed of your gospel. It is your good news that will be on display today, God. We shall see healing take place on today. We shall see people being set free on today, God. We shall see uh, your, your, your healing power, your miraculous power on today, God. Now, God, we thank you, God, for the service. We thank you for our bishop that's going to bring the spoken word on today, God. Take him higher. Take us all higher. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Can we just lift our hands and just give God a good praise? Can we just open up our mouth to give God a good praise? For just being the king of kings and the Lord of lords. God, we worship you. God, we give you the praise. Because you rule over all. God, we just lift up your name. We lift up this worship as a sacrifice to you on this morning, God. Just for waking us up and starting us on our way, God. Just for giving us the activities of our lips, God. We worship you, Jesus. We worship you, God, and we lift up our worship. We lift up our prayer. Come on, let me see you clap. Yeah. Here we go. Let everyone pray.
of your splendor and proclaim your name. Jesus forever, you're worthy of praise. You are Yahweh always. You are Yahweh always. Set forever.
Yahweh's king over earth. Your majesty we stand in on. Yahweh is king. Yahweh is king over earth. Come on, help me say. Your majesty we stand in on. One more time, say Yahweh is king over earth. Yahweh is king over earth. Your majesty we stand in on. Yahweh is king over earth. Oh, yeah. Now can we just lift our voice to the king? Yahweh is king over
Shout for 
How great thou art, the song you were singing, but let's just bring it down some. Take it from the top. Who knows it? Oh Lord, my God. When I know some wonder, consider all the works thy hands have made. I see. Sing my song. Sing my song. 
until he renews our strength. Let the glory come on you right now. All you need is the Lord right now. Let the glory come on your life. Come on. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. I want to see you. Thank you, Father. Thank you for drawing nigh to us. Thank you for coming closer. Thank you for pressing into our space. Woo. Thank you for the ointment, the therapy, the healing. That's in the room. Thank you for resting on us, making some adjustments where we need them, be it in our bodies or in our mind. Thank you for making the adjustments right now. This is a holy moment. And the Lord is making adjustments, shifting something on the inside. Somebody's fire that went out, God just rekindled it. Ooh. It's like a pilot light that went out and I just saw the Lord rekindle it. Ooh. Ooh, glory to God. I saw somebody experience conversion. Somebody over there specifically, they're being converted right now. God is turning their heart toward him. Conversion is in the room right now. He's shifting your heart toward him. He's turning your heart to see him as the best thing. In the name of the Lord, somebody's, the, the eyes of your heart they're opening and you're starting to perceive the most high. You're starting to see he's greater than everything. It makes you want to surrender your life to him right now. 
Some of you haven't cried in years and your emotions are swelling up. That means he's healing your emotions. Some of your emotions have been shut down because of trauma, but he's healing your emotions right now if you'll let the tears flow. Ooh. Ooh. Years of drama are being healed. Your emotions are coming back alive again. God is soothing your spirit. If you get out of your head and get in your heart and let him touch you right now. Ooh. Some of you are comfortable in your head, but uncomfortable in your heart. But God says, I'm doing a heart thing right now. We'll deal with your head later. Let's get the heart. Ooh. The wonderful counselor is in the house. Oh, oh, he's offering a session right now for you. He's making adjustments in perspective. How you see a thing is shifting now. When you see it without God, you see it one way. When you see it with God, you see it another way. When you see life without God, people be, are real big to you and things are real big. But when you see life with God, people are smaller and they're, they're less powerful. And so he's stripping fear out of your spirit right now because you see the big God and you're no longer afraid of the people that were created by God, both good and bad. God is moving intimidation out of your spirit, man, right now. You will not be intimidated by another person as long as you can see God in the midst of it all. Oh, yes. Hallelujah. The wonderful counselor is in the room right now. Yeah. Somebody used to be bullied when they was a little kid, but you're a grown man right now. You were bullied as a child, and the marks of that is still on your, on your spirit and on your mind. You still have that thing, that, that damage that was done. But God says he's reaching back to your elementary years, and he said, I, I'm walking the hall with you. When they used to do that stuff to you, but this, you were alone then, but this time I'm with you. And now I'm going to heal you from the damage that was done by the way you were treated as a child. The little child in you is being healed in the name of the Lord because God's going back into your childhood. There are memories that are popping up in this place right now. And God said, let me in a memory right now and I'll go into that space and I'll heal the damage that was done because I'll show you my strength. I dare you to open up a memory right now. I said, I dare you to open up a memory, God, because whatever memory you open up, I'm jumping in there with you. Oh, the counselor is in the room. to open up a memory I hear the Lord say I'll jump right in there with you and heal the memory to death That's how inner healing works. God goes back with you into those places and spaces and he gives you a different look when he's present versus when it happened and you felt alone. Be healed.
He's reshaping somebody. That thing shaped you a certain way, and God now has to reshape you. I got a minister, but can you just let him reshape you? Can we do another 60 seconds and allow the Holy Ghost to reshape us? I promise you, your experiences with him is different than your experiences without him. Same experience. When you're conscious of him, it affects you differently. Thank you, Jesus. Ooh. You gotta sing it. Come on, El Shaddai. El Shaddai. El Shaddai. Elohim and Adonai. Age to age, you're still the same. By the power. across and shake someone's hand and say welcome to embassy tell them the love of the Lord is in the house and the Lord loves you and I love you in Jesus name the blessing of the Lord is on you Mama. Woo!
want you to look forward to the Lord drawing nigh to you. He said he's going to reach to you. You'll be in the bed and you'll feel a glory come on you. He'll say, hey, let's, he wants to do something. You're not going to be always reaching to him. He's going to be reaching to you in this next season. If you respond, there's something he's going to do special for you. The next time he wakes you up at three, get up and watch what he drops in your spirit. Watch what he gives you. If it's in the middle of the day and it disrupts your day, take that moment out. He'll do more for you in that moment than your scheduled prayer time. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Gene. Thank you. The glory of the Lord is revealing himself to us in many ways, and I'm just grateful to be here, to all of our guests. Thank you for joining us. We're gonna acknowledge the guests at the end of the service now because I just sense we need to just go right into the word. But I'm happy for all the guests that are here, and we're gonna acknowledge you after I finish ministry. There's a few announcements we'll make at the end as well. I want you to turn in your Bibles, if you would, to the book of 1 Kings, chapter number 3. And we're going to begin reading at verse number 4. 1 Kings chapter number 3, verse 4. When you find it, stand with us, and we're going to read 4 through 9. The scripture says, And the king went to Gibeon to sacrifice there, for that was the great high place. A thousand burnt offerings did Solomon offer upon that altar. In Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, as what I shall give thee. That's a blank check, everybody. If the Lord asked you what you wanted, and he left it open, what would you request? And Solomon said, Thou hast shown unto thy servant David, my father, great mercy, according as he has walked before thee in truth and in righteousness and in uprightness of heart with thee. And thou hast kept for him this great kindness. Look at that. God guarded his kindness. He separated kindness and said, This is David's kindness. I kind of sense God's got this big shelf up in the heavens and he said, this is David's kindness. I got to show that to him. And he has places for you, stuff for you up on heaven's shelf, if I can use my imagination. That thou hast given him a son to sit on his throne as it is this day. And now, O oh Lord, my God, thou hast made thy servant king instead of David, my father and I am but a little child. I know not how to go out or come in. And thy servant is in the midst of thy people which thou hast chosen a great people that cannot be numbered nor counted for multitudes. Verse nine, everybody read aloud. Give therefore thy servant an understanding heart to judge thy people that I may discern between good and bad. For who is able to judge this thy so great a people? Verse 10, and the speech pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this thing. And if you read the rest of it in your spare time, you'll discover that God gave him riches and God gave him stuff he didn't ask for 
but the Lord was happy that he asked for that thing. Today I'm going to continue the series that we began some time ago on the subject of kingdom protocol. And today's protocol is goodness. We're going to talk about the way of goodness. Say it with me. The way of goodness. Thank you, Father, for your presence. Speak to us in Jesus' name. You may be seated. Amen. The way of goodness. It was yesterday while in fellowship with the Lord that he gave me a vision of thousands of individuals who were willing to risk everything in order to fulfill God's will for their life. Again, I saw a vision of thousands of people who had come to a place in their life where they were willing to risk everything in order to fulfill God's will for their life. Many of them ignored their personal fears. They ignored societal norms. And they even ignored studies, feasibility studies, in order to accomplish that which God had purposed for them to do. Then on the other hand, or conversely speaking, I saw another group of people who were influenced by their fears, intimidated by societal norms, and a believer in conventional wisdom. And because of that, they greatly modified their God-given dreams, and some even abandoned them. In God's kingdom, he has always had two groups of people. Some who were willing to risk everything in order to fulfill the purpose of God and others who were circumstanced and driven by external things. Some were called the remnant church. Everybody say the remnant church. These are those that would risk everything to do the will of God, and others operated based on what was convenient for them. This, these two distinct approaches to the things of God are not without precedent in the Bible. As a matter of fact, Moses was a part of the remnant in Israel, and remember the story when he was called to deliver the children of Israel out of Egypt, in obedience, he led them to the Red Sea. And he believed and he expected God to do something. And God opened up the Red Sea and led them through on dry ground. Moses was willing to risk his life. He was willing to risk his reputation as a leader. But he believed that God would come through. And that's one of the commonalities that you see in the remnant church or those that are willing to risk everything. They also believe that God will come through in a moment's notice. Even if it's at the last hour, they expect something to happen. They have that in common. They say, we'll risk all, but deep down inside, we're expecting God to do something miraculous to save us even if it appears that we're faltering, they just don't believe God will let them fail like that. Joshua also shared that same mindset. He, in obedience, led the children of Israel across into the promised land, uh, the Jordan River, that was flooded at the time that they were supposed to cross, and it was inconvenient to go in that day, but he was being obedient to God and he risked his life and the life of those that he led. But at the same time, he expected something to come from God. 
And God didn't let him down. Just like Moses, God came to save Joshua by rolling back the Jordan River, and they went through on dry ground. So some operate like that, and that, is, that makes other people nervous. When you are part of the Remnant Church, Remnant Church, you make people who are part of the other church, people who are just in Christendom, you make them very nervous because you appear reckless in the way you do things. But I've learned over the years, ladies and gentlemen, there's a time where God will tell you to do something that, 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 that does not fit with the societal norms, neither does it fit with the studies that have been done, neither does it fit with your internal fears. I've learned that sometimes you got to go past what you fear, you got to challenge the societal norms, and you have to be willing to risk everything in order to please God. But you also got to have in the back of your spirit that my God is God, and if he comes the last second, as long as he comes, he's going to make everything all right with me. I wonder today who's a part of the Remnant Church. I've discovered that this is the challenge of our day. Many of you are going to be given instructions from God that's going to defy the belief, the logic that you've learned and what people think. But if you step out in this moment, saith the Lord, he will not fail you. He will rescue you. He will come and stage an intervention, he'll do whatever it takes in order to get you through. If you fail to step out in this season, you'll be like the 10 spies who said, I can't go over because there's giants in the land and they've done their studies and you'll find yourself wandering in the wilderness until you fade into oblivion. We're getting ready to see a dividing line right now in the church of Jesus Christ. Some are going to expand because they trust God and some are going to shrink and, and fall back into oblivion. You must decide which way you're going to go. I believe God is re releasing a grace right now for you to get into the remnant church. If you're not there, this is the time where you need to just step over into those people who believe God despite what they see with their eyes or hear with their ears. They said, if, if I die, let me die in the army of the Lord. If I go down, I'm going to go down trusting God, and I just believe he'll raise me back up again. You got to have that kind of faith in God in this day if you plan on making your mark in this life. I declare an anointing for the remnant church to rise in this season in Jesus' name. Now clap your hands right there and let's give God. Well, maybe we're not all way, are we in the remnant church? How many in the remnant church today? I need to know. See, I'm a preacher to the remnant saints. I do. I preach to that crowd. I don't, I preach to others, but most of my message are to those who are really trying to do this thing. If you're really trying to do this thing, you're in the right church. <laughs> now, if you're playing around with it, I might get on your nerves. So I declare divine intervention. We're going to experience that. I declare recovery of it all. I declare miraculous rescue in the ninth hour, in the eleventh hour, at the last second, because you trust God, he will not fail you. Divine intervention in, in the lives of the remnant church so you can move forward in the things of God. Somebody say, let it be so in my life. Now, this is biblical. What I'm sharing with you is biblical. I'm just saying it's seasonal right now. This is the season we're in. You're going to have to take some risk. Everybody say risk. risk. And so, 
The scriptures say in Zechariah 14 and 7, Zechariah 14 and 7 affirms or corroborates God coming in the last moment. He says at the balance of the scripture, but it shall come to pass that at evening time it shall be light. The prophet Zechariah is saying evening is normally the time before the great, greatest dark, before darkness sets in. The greatest level of darkness sets in after evening. But Zechariah said we're entering into a season where when you hit that stage where you're anticipating darkness because you believe in God, in the evening it shall be light. The old church understood this scripture because they believed that right before it looked like destruction was going to take them out, they had an expectation. It's evening and it looks like night is coming, but I believe in the evening for me, it shall be light. Somebody say, for me, evening shall be light. In other words, evening is got not going to take the next step into deep darkness. Just when it looks like you're going under for the last count, just when it looks like that thing is getting ready to destroy you, you got to say it's evening and it's not going to go to darkness. In the evening, it shall be, say it, in the evening, it shall be, you got to get that one in your spirit, man, because that's the promise of the gospel era that God in the gospel era will bring light at your evening season. The old early church used to understand it because they used to sing songs about it. They used to sing songs like, I will make the darkness light before you. See, we don't sing that. What's ever wrong, he said, I'll make it right before you. When thou walkest by the way, I will lead you. On the fatness of the land, I will feed you. And a mansion in the sky, I will deed you. And the high places, I will bring them down. We used to sing that song almost every Sunday. See, I'm glad I got a little of that old school still in me because when it gets evening in my life, I say, in the evening, it shall be light. So I'm not afraid of evening time because my evening will not go to midnight. My evening will turn into day. Are you hearing me? He's able to turn that thing around. G.T. Haywood sang the song, In the evening it shall be light. And so God is turning evening into day. Lift those hands and receive that promise right now. I declare if you believe in this gospel light, your evening shall be turned into day. So step out now. Go ahead and get the courage to launch out into the deep and risk something because the worst that can happen is it can get evening time but it's not going to turn night on my watch. Somebody shout amen. Now I need you to clap your hands right there and give the Lord a praise for that. Amen. I declare evening light. I declare evening light over your life. Evening light over your life. And so in order for this to happen, of course, this light that's coming in the evening, I believe, has to do with protocols. I believe it is the gospel light. It's more than protocols, but I think God is sending us protocols in this season because they're meant to be a light to save us. Learning the ways of God have always been, from God's perspective, a way to save people. It's the ways of God, and protocols are nothing but the king's way and so when you get his way in your life those ways will save your existence 
Protocols have ne nothing to do with just external uh, 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 behavior, but it is an internal disposition that expresses itself in an external behavior. So it is not legalism, it is the true way in a person. And the more, uh, let's say this way, the number of God's ways inside of a person will determine the greater, will, will, will actually determine how his power and life can work through them. So the goal of the believer is to embrace, everybody say, the ways of God. Amen. Remember, children of Israel only knew God's actions, but Moses knew God's ways. That's why he was so powerful. I want to talk about today the way of goodness as one of God's ways that is meant to augment our life and actually save us from the enemy's plan. It's something about the goodness of the Lord that has the power to rescue us in any difficulty of our life. And I've said this before, uh, that every protocol that I seem to study, I say, this is the one, this is the one we need. But I'm telling you, the goodness, goodness protocol could be one of the best. Now, the truth is, all of his character is great. But this one is one you don't want to miss. If you get this one in your life, I guarantee you, it will change your life forever. And so I need you to listen up. I'm going to talk about this protocol from the book of Kings, chapter number 3. And we're going to begin in verse number 4. But I want to make just three points this morning. I want to talk about point number 1, unrestrained worship. Point number two, hearing. And point number three, goodness. We're going to deal with those three points, and they will help us unpack this particular protocol. And so let's look at the text. It's in the first book of Kings, chapter number three, that Solomon, King Solomon, succeeds his father David uh, as king of Israel. And he's a little overwhelmed. Uh, with the duties and the responsibility of a king, uh, he doesn't feel adequate or he doesn't feel as if he has the ability to do a job like his dad. And so uh, he seeks God to grow him. Everybody say grow him. Listen to me. As opposed to him shrinking and saying this is too much, he says, no, I'm going to level up to what God has called me to be. And I see two types of people again in the church world. Some feel overwhelmed with who God sees you to be or what the responsibility he's put on your life, and you can shrink. And then others will say, no, as opposed to shrinking, I'm going to trust God to grow me so I can meet the expectations that he has for my life. And there are some things that he's about to place on your shoulders and responsibility that's going to require you to function at a higher level. And I don't want you to choke. Look at your neighbor and say, don't choke. And, 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 and neither, neither must you shrink God's plan down to your level. You see, all of us can only lead to the level of our incompetency. In other words, if this church grows beyond my level to lead it, then I, e I either need to grow or step down and let somebody that can lead at that level take my place. You should never hold back an operation because you're unable to lead at the level that is required for that operation. But some people will bring the operation down to their level in order to stay in power. And all the folks that are in that environment have to shrink to hang around you. But you don't want anybody to have to shrink to hang around you. You're going to have to level up. Somebody shall level up to be what God already know you are. Look at somebody and shout, level up, level up, level up. Level up. Amen. You, you, you cannot expect someone to follow you if you are bringing them down to your level. Leadership is about raising people up 
to what God has set for them to do. So I can't be the head of my house. I can't be the head of anything that outgrows my ability to lead it unless I'm ready to level up. And so there's a grace in the house right now for us to level up. I am so grateful that Solomon did not say, bring the people down or these people are getting on my nerves. See, you can't judge the people who are coming at you. You have to rise to a level where you can rise above them in order to lead them. So he knew what he really needed was growth. And so he does not feel adequate to take this position. But he knows he has it because his father, he, he's number one, he's a descendant of David and he was the chosen one. And so he goes to a place called Gibeon. And there he says, I got to talk to the Lord about this so God can help me. And that's a great place to go. And the Bible says he offered 1,000 burnt offerings. And the burnt offerings were animals that represent you offering your whole being to God. And so this is my first point. And I want to talk about it just for a moment. Uh, unhindered or uh, unrestrained worship. He went to Gibeon to worship God. And in order to worship God, he offered 1,000 burnt offerings and the burnt offerings, he was saying to God, I am yours from the top of my head to the sole of my feet. I am yours. But he said it a thousand times. And the Bible said that God came to him in a dream because he drew nigh to God. God's now is drawing nigh to him. God came to him in a dream and said, Solomon, what do you want? In other words, you can have anything that you want if you're going to give me that kind of unrestrained worship and you're going to tell me a thousand times that I am yours completely, then I know I got to give you whatever you want. I need everybody in the room to know that we're in a season where we must give God unrestrained worship because unrestrained worship is going to cause God to draw nigh to you and allow you to have a level of communion with him that will alter your life forever. Say it with me, unrestrained worship. Now, I don't want you to think this is a kind of worship, you know, that has to do with how loud you holler or any of that thing. I think this unrestrained worship had more to do with his time. If one burnt offering, one burnt offering uh, may have taken uh, an hour to complete then how much time did he spend in offering a thousand burnt offerings? He, had, he needed days to offer a thousand burnt offerings to the Lord. Unrestrained worship is the kind of worship where you don't enter into it with a clock or a time frame saying, if God don't talk to me in a half an hour, I'm out of here or I don't have anything else on the agenda. Unrestrained worship is when you say, I'm going in to worship God and I'll come out when he dismiss me. Now, I know some of you busy people think that that's an impossibility. I'm not talking about corporate worship. This was personal worship. Solomon had an issue that was his personal. It wasn't the congregation. So I'm not saying we're going to be here all day worshiping like that, but I think everybody needs at least one day a week where you enter into your closet and your devotions before God and you say, I'm not coming out until he dismiss me. Because as long as you got a clock on God, God feels like you're in charge. And you're telling him that you belong to him, but he knows you don't fully belong because you haven't given him your time yet. But when you're willing to give God your T-I-M-E, then God will say some things to you in those moments. Things will happen. You can't commune with God with unrestrained worship and he not leave a residue on your spirit 
something special happen to you. It's impossible. I'm telling you, if you sleep with a dog, you might get up with what? Fleas, they say. Sleep with a woman, you might pick up her spirit. Sleep with a man, you can pick up his spirit. And if you commune with God with unrestrained worship, it's impossible to walk out of there without picking up something from God. And God says, all I need is just one day a week at least where you let me be in charge of the clock. And I I'm going to put some things in you that'll change your life forever. Now, you might say, Bishop, you can do that because you don't have a natural job because it, it was during the COVID season where I really started getting into this on another level. You know, everything was shut down during COVID. You remember that? And I said, Lord, what are we going to do? He said, give me your time. That's what he told me. He said, you, ain't, you can't go preach like you were. You can't do all that traveling. I want that time. And so I actually sat before God sometimes five hours, sometimes eight hours in one setting. And I learned that through setting before God all of that time, that there were some things that I had never heard him say. He left a deposit in me. He took my whole life to another level. I was actually, as I've shared, thinking about retiring, but after that COVID season, I was a brand new man. I felt like I was just getting started in ministry. I felt a new wind, a new energy, a new fire. It was because it was in that season that he left the greatest deposit in my life. And you say you don't have time to do it. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. Listen to me. You wasting time. You got too many time wasters in your life. You see, when you spend the time with God, he'll tell you, don't go to that meeting. He'll tell you, oh, bypass that. He'll tell you, leave that alone. And he'll put the stuff in you that's crucial to your advancement and you will overcome your time wasters. And, and, and so God is calling us. He's, I hear the Lord saying he wants wants our time in this season. And if you can give God some quality time in your life, you're going to experience transformation uh, beyond what your wildest dreams could ever imagine. It's called unrestrained worship. And I wonder if there's anybody in here that's willing to give God at least one day of your life where you step into your devotions and you say, I'm not coming out until he dismiss me. I guarantee you one day you're going to come out looking like Superman. You're going to come out looking like Superwoman. You're going to come out with gifts activated. You're going to come out with courage in your soul. You can't hang out with the king and not become royal yourself in your temperament. You can't hang out with the master and not learn how to master your own life. You can't hang out with the holy one and not walk in holiness yourself. I want to declare a season of unrestrained worship in this house. What would worship be like in the church if everybody spent time with God at home? What would it be like when we get together in the congregation of the righteous when everybody is spending time with God at home? My God, we would see God do miracle signs and wonders in our midst. So I did Declare in your midst a season of worship, a Sabbath, a time of healing, a time for rest, a time for revelation, a time for discovery, a time for insight, a time for downloads, a time for God to flood your life with himself, a time for transformation. If you do it in six months, you will not be the same person that you are right now. unrestrained worship. Lift those hands just for me. You're going to overcome time wasters in this field. And that's my first point. So Solomon offered a thousand burnt offerings. And God said, what do you want? You can't do that without God giving you what you need. 
And I want you to pay close attention now to my second point. Solomon does not ask for riches. He has a blank check, but he does not ask for money. Neither does he ask for his enemy's life. He asked for something on a higher level. You know what he asked for? He asked that God would give him a wise and a understanding heart so that he could know the difference between good and bad, that I may discern between good and bad for who is able to judge so thy uh, this great people. I'm the king, and I got to know how to discern. What this actually means is he says, I need to know. Uh, I don't feel adequate as the king. I don't understand the ways of budgeting for a nation. I don't understand the ways of, of, of immigration laws. And, and I'm the king, and I don't understand the ways of the military like my father did and the ways of, of, of uh, foreign affairs. He said, there's a lot about being the king that I just don't understand. He says, so I need you to give me a what? Everybody say a wise and an understanding heart. That word wise heart or understanding heart actually means a heart that hears. He says, I want you to give me a heart that can hear. See, if your heart can hear, your heart will hear the ways of things. If you're listening and you listen to people from your head, men look on the outward appearance and they make their judgment, but God looks at the heart. So God can hear the ways of people or the ways of this and the ways of that. And Solomon said, in order for me to rule, I have to learn the ways of everything. Because once I learn the way that money works and the way that this industry works and the way that politics work, I, once I learn all of that, then I'm able to rule like a king. But if I'm just looking at it from the outside and operating from my education that I got, but I don't know the inner workings of it, I'm going to misjudge many things. And so Solomon says, above money and above my enemy's life, I want to know the ways of things. So give me a heart that can hear. He said, give me a heart that can hear. And I think this is an excellent point that I need to make. Ladies and gentlemen, we, got, uh, we have to move past that prayer and asking God for money. Churches that are just built on asking God for money or people save life that's built on, Lord, I, I just need money. You know, m all my money spent and, and, and uh, uh, time to pay the rent and, 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 and whatever, however that song went. It, if... <laughs> If that's the level I'm still on, then my relationship with God is at a very low level. If it's just about meeting my physiological needs, if I'm walking with God just to get my physiological needs met, then I'm operating at a very low level. If God gives you a blank check and you ask him for a house, if God gives you a blank check and you ask him for a car or something materialistic, I'm saying that should not occupy your prayer time at all. These are the things that the Gentiles seek after. These are the things that those that don't have covenant with God seek after. I will not monopolize my prayer type asking God for a new boiler or asking God for a new kitchen sink or asking God for a new car. What? God says you're talking to the king of kings and you're going to ask me for that? If I give you a, a blank check and that's what's on your mind. I declare this church graduated from that level. Come on, somebody. The slaves used to sing a song, and it was when we get to heaven, all of God's children are going to get some shoes. And that was their revelation of heaven because the slave could not wear shoes. So they saw God and heaven as the place where they'll finally get some shoes. And the materialism, the church must not be preoccupied with prayers that are focused on material things or blessings. 
I know the whole church world has been dominated by that, but that shows you the elementary level that we have functioned at for decades. But we're growing out of that. Somebody shout, we're growing out of that. Doesn't mean those things aren't important because they are. But I will not monopolize God's time or my opportunity to talk to the master with physiological issues. It's like if you get to meet the president, you only got three minutes. What's your elevator speech? You can't be talking foolishness. You only got three minutes. Well, if God says, here's a blank check, what do you want? Well, my back hurts, Lord. Neither did he ask for his enemy's life. So many times people move from physiological needs or materialism in their seeking of God to the, those who hate me and those who are against me and their enemy focus. But you can't spend your life being enemy focused. When you look on Facebook and on social media, you see so many hurt people posting stuff about stuff and you just see, look at all that pain in them trying to respond to something that's hurting on the inside. Enemy focus. Don't spend your time with God worrying about your enemies. I don't spend time asking for prayer, asking for stuff in my prayer time, neither do I spend time talking about enemies. I spend time saying, Lord, give me a wise and a hearing heart. I need you to give me something that's going to make me better. Are you hearing me? Something that's going to cause me to grow so I can manage my enemies, <laughs> so I can make my own money and make my own way prosperous. You must not be preoccupied with God taking care of you in the natural. We have to be preoccupied with ruling with God over the responsibility that he's given me, given us. Solomon was concerned about how to rule a nation. He wasn't concerned about his own needs. He was put in a place of power. And many of you are in a place of power, and what you need is to have the wisdom to know how to manage your family, manage your wife, learn the ways of things that are around you so you can benefit and lead those that you're in charge of. God's raising up the right kinds of leaders today. Not those that are looking to get paid or in leadership so they can get some money or become a preacher because they can buy a Cadillac or become something so they can get something out to deal. That's not why God puts you in position. He puts you in a position to rule and to bless and to raise the world that surrounds you. So your prayer is Lord give me wisdom so I can level up and make a difference in this world shall give me wisdom Lord give me wisdom his prayer was teach me the way of everything give me a heart that can hear listen if you can hear people's pain if you can hear people's aspirations with your heart you can hear that stuff with your heart you can hear people's hurts with your heart you can hear people's disgust with your heart, you can hear people's hopes and dreams. You can hear people's guilt and shame and fears. With your heart, you can hear the ways that are in people, and that's how you know how to help them. When you're discerning, your discernment is about your heart listening to their heart. If you love your wife, learn her ways. Listen to her heart. Sometimes, and husband, sometimes when people talk, their speech does not necessarily uh, articulate the true essence of their heart. Sometimes their words are jumbled. And if you just listen to what people say and say, well, you said this and said that, you're on the surface, my friend. Men look on the outward appearance but God looks on the heart. Listen with your heart. All you got to do is be married long enough. You'll know that sometimes when your wife speaks, no means yes. And sometimes when she says something, yes means maybe. But you got to hear the heart. You can't just hear what they say because this may mean that. And sometimes when I'm saying leave me alone, I'm really saying mess with me. You got to read my spirit if you're going to understand what we're doing. We don't always say exactly what's in our heart, but if you listen into my way, you know what I mean. <laughs> 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 
Somebody shout the way, the way, the way. And so listen with your heart because your heart can hear their heart. If you listen with your head, you'll hear their head. If you listen with your heart, you'll hear their heart. Can you feel me? But I was really saying, now you're listening with your heart. And so Solomon asked for a hearing heart so that he could lead the people effective. And God is raising up powerful leaders in this day who are able to hear the heart of a person because they have so much misjudgment and so much confusion and so much fighting and so much blame and all this uh, negative activity and trauma because people are misjudging those that are around them. But if they could only hear their hearts, they would know exactly how to position themselves and respond. And so God is opening up your, the ear of your heart right now. If you give your heart to the Lord today in that kind of way, he's going to open up the ear of your heart. We used to sing a song, open the eyes of my heart, but now I'm saying open the ears of my heart and give me understanding. For those that have understanding are the ones that will be able to govern and rule and reign for God. In all thy getting, get an understanding. Because of this, Solomon becomes the wisest king of his time. And he was able to advance everybody in his kingdom. If you check the record, he was so wise, he could speak of the ant. Because he could hear the way of an ant. And he wrote about ants, and he wrote about the bee, and he wrote about animals, and he wrote about women, and he wrote about men. He wrote songs because he was a philosopher, and he was a man who understood the ways. And so Solomon was one of the greatest kings that Israel had ever known because God gave him a wise and understanding heart, or God gave him a listening ear. And I want you to lift your hands just one more time, and I want to say over you and declare over you by faith, I, I, I pray that God would give you a heart that can hear in this season because if you have a heart that can hear it will prosper you in all of your way you'll be sitting at a meeting and somebody will be saying no but you'll hear what they're really saying and you'll be able to discern what's actually going on in your life and you won't be deceived by anybody I declare hearts that can hear in this season and we will no longer be surface dwellers now clap your hands and give him praise one more time the gift of discernment is on your life now. Now, in my closing, I need to talk about the result of all of this, which is the goodness of the Lord. For notice what he says, I need to have a heart to hear so I can discern between, what did he say, good and bad. In other words, he needed to know goodness so that he could discern what was not good. And that way he could make right judgments. And so the goodness of the Lord or goodness in the Bible comes from a Greek word, uh, a Hebrew word rather, which is tov, T-O-V. And what that word means is uh, something that is highly functional and something that gives life. Say it with me. Highly functional and give life. If it is good, it is what? Highly functional and it will give life. This is how you know what's good. It means it's functioning according to its design. When God uh, created the world in the book of Genesis chapter number one, after he made something or created something, what did he say? He looked back at it and what did he say? It is Good. What was he saying? It's doing what it's supposed to do, and it is giving life. If he made a tree, he says this tree has to bring forth fruit. If the tree doesn't bring forth fruit, it's a bad tree. If the tree brings forth fruit, but the fruit doesn't have a seed in it, so it can reproduce itself and give life, it's still a bad tree. 
is not a good tree until it does what it was created to do. It must be highly functional. Glory to God. If it's good, it is functional and it gives life. Now, this is so important because there are all kinds of things in the world and you got to know what's good and what's not good. And this is how you assess it. This is the litmus test. Check out whether or not it's giving life and check out whether or not it's doing what it was designed to do. It doesn't mean that they're a bad person, but they're functioning in a bad way if they're not giving life or doing what they're supposed to do. Now, now a mule uh, is an animal that is a crossbreed from a horse and a donkey. And we have to understand that a mule has done a whole lot of good, people would say, in this life. But a mule is not good. The reason why it's not good is because it has 63 chromosomes. A horse has 64 and a donkey has 62. A horse and a donkey is an original species that can reproduce. Though a mule may give you a ride, it cannot produce another mule. Therefore, it's not life-giving. Regardless of how much pleasure is involved that the mule may give you, it's still a bad mule. And there are many things that people are dealing with that gives them pleasure, but if it won't allow them to reproduce, it's not a good idea. If you can hear what I'm saying. Can you hear my heart then? The point I'm making is, if it's not reproducible, it's not good. And if it is not functioning according to his design, it is not good. And if we allow bad things to permeate our life, then bad things corrupt the world that we are in. They will ultimately have a corrupting influence. But good destroys evil. This is why good is so important. Good has the power to overcome evil. The Bible says don't go, don't match fire for fire or go evil for evil, but overcome evil with good. Good is the only thing that destroys evil. Why? Because good is function, high functionality, functioning at the highest level of God's design, and it has a seed in it. And evil can't, or bad can't stand before something that's functioning the way God said it should function. And so what the Lord told me is we're in a time, ladies and gentlemen, where we're getting ready to see a bunch of highly functional people in the kingdom of God because goodness will cause you to function at a high level. And many people haven't had a lot of goodness in their life. They said, I didn't have a lot of goodness, and that's why functionality is low. But God says goodness is getting ready to follow you all the days of your life. And, and, and God is a good God. Yes, he is. God is a good God. Goodness is his nature. And so if you hang out with God, you can't help but be impacted by his goodness. Goodness even can bring you to repentance. You can't even hold on to, to a certain way that's contrary to God if you keep experiencing the goodness of the Lord because the goodness of the Lord will cause you to change your mind. It's hard to hold on to bitterness when, you, when somebody treats you real good. Oh, I tested this thing. I said, let me see if good really overcomes evil. Somebody was upset with me and somebody had an issue with me and somebody didn't like me. Can you believe it? They didn't like me. So I said, I'm going to see. I'm going to see. I'm going to see if I can crush that stuff in them. So I start treating them good. Write them a nice good check. Pow. Are you listening to me? And do some kind things. And, and then after a while, they changed their attitude. It, it wasn't that they loved me so much, but it was the goodness that I was showing that wouldn't allow them to hold on to their bitterness. 
There are some people that say, I don't like LeBron James. He's arrogant. He's a billionaire. I don't like LeBron James. Let LeBron James write you a check for $500,000. I guarantee you'll be like, that's my favorite basketball player. You know, something about LeBron James. I just like him, man. I, I like LeBron. Man, he's my boy. Because goodness, see, you, you, you don't like certain people because you're not experiencing goodness. Are you hearing me? But when you start experiencing the goodness of the Lord, it changes your heart. You cannot hold on to evil because good will overcome evil. That's why the Bible says, bless them that curse you. Pray for them that despitefully use you. Do good to them that are not doing good to you. Are you hearing me? If you, if you see goodness as a weapon, you can go in and change the world that is around you. I would like to have a good family. Are you hearing me? I want to have a good church. I think we should have a good community. Well, we can make it good. All we have to do is do good and it'll overcome the evil. This is a church that must be a good church, meaning that we believe in treating people good. And if you treat them good, guess what? You're going to cause them to function at a very high level. A good church is a bunch of people functioning at a very high level. The deacons are functioning at a high level of deaconhood. And the ushers are functioning at a high level of uh, uh, guest services. And the ministers are functioning at that very, very high level. And the singers are at a very, very high level. And, and, and who else is here? And the administrators at a high level. Are you listening to that? And, and the worship is at a high, high level. Uh, what, what would it be like if everybody was functioning at a very, 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 very high level? Uh, uh, highly, highly effective people functioning at a very high level. That's the kind of church God has ordained. All you need is goodness to hit that house. When people say, I'm going to accept the goodness of the Lord in my life, it's going to raise your functionality in your way, and then you will raise up everything that is around you. So I want you to know God said in this season, this is a season of goodness coming into your life because God wants you to grow. God wants you to function at a higher level. God wants you to make your family good. He wants you to make your business good. He wants you to make your neighborhood good. Every relationship can be good. You don't have to have a bad relationship. Just do good to people and it'll change their mind. Goodness overcomes evil. I will not have a bad life when I've got the goodness of the Lord in my life. I will not have a bad life when the Lord has been good to me. Oh, yes. How many want the goodness of the Lord in your life? I guarantee you it'll break the power of bad. And so there's some bad things that we just need to break. You must not content yourself with living with bad. Don't normalize bad in your life when you have a good God. Don't normalize bad in your life when God is always doing you good. So there's some things that we just need to end right now. What are some bad things we need to end? We, we, we need to end, we, we could end a uh, foster care system. We could just end the whole system if every parent did good to their children. If every parent did good to their own children, we could end the whole foster care system. Do you see that? We could end a whole lot of bad if people did good. Evil, evil can only prevail when good men do nothing. Good can, evil can only stand in the absence of good. So if you see evil, that means some, nobody's doing good in that environment. And God has made it our responsibility to do good works. He redeemed us for the purpose of doing good works. The Bible says we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. God's plan was that everybody in the church would have a stack of good works that they would have to fulfill before they leave this earth. And they would find places where bad was taking place and they would just say, how much good need to be over there so we can run that bad right out of that place? And they would release good in that spot and overthrow the bad. Put these verses up on the board really quick. And I know I'm going long today, but I'm going to end this in just a moment. Put the verses on the board. I want you to see them. Can I have a few more minutes, please? Read these verses. What does it say? And let us not be weary in 
well doing for? We shall reap if we faint not. Next verse. Everybody read. Trust in the Lord and do good, so shall thou dwell in the land. And verily thou shalt be fed. Next verse. Read. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath ordained that we should walk in them. They're works that you were ordained to do. Next verse. Blessed are they which... That was the wrong verse. Next verse. Go past it. Somebody should... <laughs> See, see that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to. Do you see goodness is a weapon? Say it with me. Goodness is a. You want to do spiritual warfare. You want to holler and scream, don't you? Why don't you just go do good to some people and watch that thing change? Next verse. They that do good, they that be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate. Next verse. Is that it? There were some more. There it is. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. What did Jesus do? He went about doing? What's your mission? To do good. Next verse. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and Tony Bennett, the basketball coach of the Virginia Cavaliers college team, is the winningest coach in their uh, school or in their history. And one particular year, he had an excellent team, and they had an almost undefeated season, and they went to the tournaments and they lost the first game against the 16th seed. The people were crushed, shocked, and they came to him, the head coach, and he says, listen, I do more in this. My reason for being a coach is not just to win games, it's to do good to these kids. He was a man of faith. He says, I'm here to build the people. The next year, he took the same team and they won the whole championship. And the school was so grateful that they offered him another contract with all kinds of millions of dollars to stay a few more years. He says, I'll stay a few more years, but I don't want the money. He says, I want you to take the money and give it to my staff and give it to other programs so we can raise them up too. He was a man of faith. How many of, of you would do that? <laughs> he saw an opportunity to do, to do what? Good. Proverbs said, when it is in thy power to do good, you're supposed to do good. Why? Good overcomes evil. If you're sick of evil... Let's make a commitment today to do good. I want you to stand to your feet right there. This is a protocol. This is not a suggestion. This is the way of the king. When God comes into your life, he's not coming to your life to hurt you. He's coming to your life to do good to you. As a matter of fact, if it gets all mixed up, he says, I'll still work all things together for the good. God is a good God. A good God. And so his people should be good people. 
I always say, Deacon Lawler, I say, that's a good man. Look at that good man back there. That's a good man. When we say somebody's a good person, what we're really saying is they're functioning the way they were meant to function, and they're giving life. That's the proof of goodness. You want a good marriage? People say, I got married problems. You know why? I've, I've been passionate for, it seems like 100 years, but it hasn't been a little hyperbole. But listen, I've listened to enough cases to know that most of the time when people have marriage problems, most of the time, it's because they stop functioning. This person is no longer functioning like a husband, and this person is no longer functioning like a wife, and yet they want a good marriage. You have to function and give life. That'll turn a marriage around in just probably a couple of weeks. You want good relationship with your siblings? Function like a sister or brother. Look at somebody and say, function. How many of you have seen your, kid, your own kidneys before? You ever seen your kidneys? Have you seen your heart before? On an x-ray or something like that? Or what are those things called? Uh, yeah. Have you seen your uh, lungs? I mean, with your own natural eyes? Anybody seen their lungs with their natural eyes? Have you seen your spleen with your natural eyes? How do you know it's there? Yeah, it's functioning. It's functioning. Let it stop functioning. You're going to say, hey, something's wrong. <laughs> something's bad. That's what you're going to say. Something's bad going on. We are the body of Christ. All of us are members. When something's wrong in the kingdom, you know what the problem is? Somebody stopped functioning. When people get hurt, you know the first thing they do in relationship? They stop functioning. That's the worst you could do. Press past your feelings. Get healed. If my wife and I are having some intense fellowship, and we disagree about something, we don't stop functioning. I still got to do all the stuff that I've been doing. She still has to do everything she's been doing. This disagreement has nothing to do with me functioning. When you stop functioning, it's a sign of immaturity. It really is. You're so hurt, now you say, oh, so I ain't, I'm not doing this no more. I, ain't, I used to do this every day, but now I quit. I quit this, I quit that. I quit the other. No. Deal with your issue while you're continuing your responsibility. Come on, let's worship the Lord in this place. Some people, they'll even stop speaking to you. You ever run into those kind of people? They got an issue, so they, don't, they, don't, they can't even speak no more. They say, they say, they say it's like this, I'm going to keep it real. Every time they're keeping it real. I'm going to keep it real. I ain't going to be fake, so I ain't going to speak to them. Speaking is so cheap. Keep functioning. We'll get through the problem. Then once we fix it, now we're going to start talking. You should have never stopped. You can say, I'm speaking, but we got an issue. We need to talk. But I'm still, hey, you all right? I still love you. You love me. We good, but we need to talk. We have to learn the way. This is how the king operates. Your, your royalty. So good. Sing it.
Jesus. You want goodness in your life. You want special prayer for something. You want a touch from God. Want to join this church? I want you to step out and come to this altar right now. Anybody that says, I want to join the church, I want to be filled with the Holy Spirit, I want prayer, I need something from God, I need this goodness in my life, I want you to come now. Step out and come to this altar. The altar team is going to talk to them. Some of them want to join the church, I'm sure.
I want you all to just pray for higher functionality. You're going to receive the goodness of the Lord, but I want you to see an area in your life that you want to function at a higher level. Pick one. You're going to receive the goodness of the Lord, and that's going to help you do it. The goodness of the Lord is like positive vibes. It's energy that will increase your functionality in the way he designed you. So get something in your spirit right now. You can find a partner, or you want to pray by yourself is your call. But I want you to take a few moments of prayer for higher functionality in a certain area. Find a partner or pray alone. Let's pray now. Go for it. Go for it. Pray. Believe God. Father, I pray that this house becomes a good house. Every gift operates at its optimum level. I pray that every family represented here function at a higher level. I ask God that your goodness would flood every husband and give that husband a vision for a higher level of operation. <laughs> give that wife a vision for a higher level of functionality in the home. Pray for the children. And all the children would function at a higher level in their space with their parent, with their siblings. We want to function good. Let your goodness permeate us. We pray for every one of our relationships. Give us a hearing heart so we can hear the heart of those we're connected to. That we might function in relationships at a very high level, making it a good relationship. Break the power of bad in the name of Jesus Christ. I pray in your mighty name that there would not be one bad marriage in this church. Woo! 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 I pray in the name of Jesus there would not be one bad family in this church. But all would be good. God looked at it and he said it was good and very good. I pray for higher functionality. That people would not have bad experiences when they come to this church. That this would be a church that treat people good in the name of the Lord. And they would only have good experiences here. Because it's a good people and a good church. And if by chance there's a bad experience, we would correct it and do good in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're asking, oh God, that you would function, help us function at a higher level. Take us, help us level up in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Help us level up. Nobody has bad uh, financial issues. Nobody has bad governmental issues, their, their employment situation good would permeate every space of our life. I see goodness like a river flowing to every area of your life right now. God says, I've got enough goodness for everything that you touch. If you let me fill your heart with my goodness, it will function right. Come on, somebody. Come into an agreement with this thing and pray and believe your God that his goodness would permeate every part of your life in the name of Jesus Christ. I dare you to put your faith way out there and level up. Come on up to the next level in Jesus' mighty name. Ah, good men, good women, good sons and daughters, good everything, everything good, everything good, everything good, very good, say it, very good, very good, everything good, good, everything. Somebody says, how are you doing? You say, good, I'm functioning the way I'm supposed to function. And I'm giving life. We could end foster care if every parent did good. Almost every problem you see in the world could be solved if we would just do. We could register a thousand people for this conference that's coming up the 28th of September. 
We could register a thousand people if everybody in this church just did good. See, there, there are things that we labor with that shouldn't require labor if everybody just did good. You could solve so many issues with life if everybody just did their part. I want you to, I, I want you to own your responsibility for functioning. Say 100% participation. You have a role in everything. That's a good church. You know what? We got to start telling the truth. If it's not good, we need to say, it is not good. God said, it's not good for man to be. Some things he said, it's not good. Sometimes we see, that's a good little boy. Yes, he's a good boy. Some people, sometimes we call bad good and... Solomon wanted discernment so he wouldn't do that. In this day and time, guess what we're doing in this world? We're calling bad good and good bad. That's a sign of an unwise heart and it's a sign of a reprobate spirit. If you do good to someone and they don't respond to your goodness, if you do good to someone and they don't respond, because everybody should respond to goodness. But there are some people that you can keep doing good, keep doing good, and they never respond. You know what that means? They're reprobate. That's the truth. If somebody's acting up, I'll try to do good and just keep doing. God will say, do good for six months. He'll say, do good for two years. If they don't respond, God will say, let, let it go. Then they're in his hands. That's the flat out truth. It means that goodness is not taking. So they've chosen not to embrace good. The average person responds to goodness. Some people won't respond because they won't open up to it. And if you don't open up to goodness, guess who you're not opening up to? You're not opening up to because he is a good God. Father, I pray that we walk in your goodness because this is a season of goodness hitting our life. Woo! God says, I'm coming nigh to you and I'm bringing goodness into your life. I thank you for the goodness. You've been good to me down through the years, though. But I thank you for the goodness that's coming in this season. Woo, God. And I thank you for the evil that's being destroyed in this season because of the goodness of the Lord. Now let's clap our hands and give the Lord a shout in this house. I'm going to ask you to raise that shout up before we go. Come on, put a voice to that. Receive our offerings. Thank you, team. today please stand to your feet so we can acknowledge you all the guests in the house please stand to your feet look at here let's thank God for the guests praise the Lord thank you for coming please remain standing our guest service team has something for you they're going to hand it to you they're handing it out right now when you get it we want you to know we appreciate you coming I know you could have went anywhere else stay standing they got a gift for you Thank you for coming. We really appreciate it. We really do. I hope you enjoyed the service. I really do. I know I was a little long today, but you know, th that's, that's good, I hope. No, I don't. Thank you for coming. Please uh, receive the gifts and fill out the QR code that's in the gifts. Thank you. We have someone right here waiting. You're in the hands of the ushers at this time. We have someone right here waiting. We have two people standing right here waiting. If 
you're going to give by electronic means, there is a QR code right there. You can use that and give electronically. If you're going to give in person, we want you to stand to your feet at this time. And you are in the hands of the ushers who are directing you from the rear of the house. You can come and bring those gifts right now. Thank you. watching my live stream thank you for joining us today thank you for joining us we love you so much we'll see you next time god bless everybody the host is returning thank you love you all good to see you. i see uh gg lola dd gg something like that good to see you take a moment scan the qr code located on the screen to complete our connect card 
Thank you for completing your Connect Card. If you would like to complete the Connect Card at a later time, look inside of your welcome bag now and you will locate the same QR code in the bag. For those who complete the Connect Card today, please visit our Grounded Cafe for a token of our love and appreciation. I'm Hugh Daniel Smith, and I am encouraging everyone to register and begin preparing now for this year's Kingdom Encounter Conference scheduled for September 28th through the 30th. The thematic content of this year's encounter shall revolve around the ideal of a kingdom renaissance. I'm absolutely persuaded that we are in the midst of a rebirthing and a rediscovering of the way God intended for all things to operate. The church must be equipped to articulate and display the way of God as it relates to virtue ethics, physics, technology, that includes AI, biology, metaphysics, logic, poetry, theater, music, psychology, economics, politics, and government, and several other sciences. It's not about teaching people what God wants in this day, but we must teach them the how-tos. And that's what this conference is focused on. This season is not exclusively about teaching what the church must do again, but it's about how or the way things must be done. Ladies and gentlemen, this year's encounter is poised to reveal to us what a world would look like if Christ was at the center of everything. Imagine that. Learning the ways of God shall be the means by which we shall experience a kingdom renaissance. So go and register today. All you have to do is go to www.kingdomencounterconference.com. All you have to do is go there and register now, and I guarantee you, you won't be disappointed. We're learning the way, the how-tos. See you there. You must recognize it's the order of heaven, and the closer I become to manifesting heaven's order in the earth, the greater the glory is going to be in my life. I see glory filling this temple. So there's nothing the devil can really do to you on this road, because even if a bad thing happens, you're going to turn that thing around. Desire to serve during the Kingdom Encounter Conference? Visit the midweek today and sign up. Once you sign up, Elder Bethany and the planning team will contact you with additional information. Are you in need of baptism in the Holy Spirit or desire a refreshing? We encourage you to join Pastor DeBrand and the Holy Ghost Impartation Team every other month on the third Sunday of the month. Holy Ghost Impartation is this month on Sunday, August 20th. Our Grief Share Support Group begins in September. This support group is here to help anyone who has lost a spouse, child, family member, or friend or grieving in any way overcome and navigate through this difficult time. This group offers emotional support and tools to overcome and thrive after grief. Grief Share begins Tuesday, September 5th, and concludes Tuesday, December 5th. It will be at 6.30 weekly online. Visit griefshare.com and search for Embassy Covenant Church International to sign up today or see your midweek email. Mark your calendars and invite all your friends and family for our special pre-conference Big Sunday service on Sunday, September 17th. We are elated to have Bishop Bismarck and Pastor Chichi with us on that Sunday. Bishop Bismarck will be our special guest speaker. Let's pack the house out. Join Bishop, Pastor Letha, and your Jabula Worldwide leaders and family in experiencing the land of the Bible. With its significant biblical history and rich culture, this trip to Israel is one you will not want to miss. Mark your calendars for July 15th through the 24th of next year. That's 2024. Please note, you must submit your registration by visiting our church website at embassycovenant.church or by reading your midweek email. There is no deposit required to secure your spot and the rate listed for this trip 
is subject to change based on your departure location and the date of your registration. Finally, this trip to Israel is not exclusive to Embassy, so secure your spot today as seats are extremely limited. Bishop Smith will be holding a meeting to discuss charter schools. If you are an educator or someone interested in this conversation, please see this week's midweek to sign up or scan the QR code located on the screen or see the Welcome Center to sign up today. Visit our website for online giving, events, and to learn more about what's going on in your church community. Thank you for choosing to worship with us today. If you are a first-time guest, we'd love to stay in touch with you. Take a moment, scan the QR code located on the screen to complete our Connect card. Thank you for completing your Connect card. If you would like to complete the Connect card at a later time, look inside of your welcome bag now, and you will locate the same QR code in the bag. For those who complete the Connect card today, please visit our Grounded Cafe for a token of our love and appreciation. I'm Hugh Daniel Smith, and I am encouraging everyone to register and begin preparing now for this year's Kingdom Encounter Conference scheduled for September 28th through the 30th. The thematic content of this year's encounter shall revolve around the ideal of a kingdom renaissance. I'm absolutely persuaded that we are in the midst of a rebirthing and a rediscovering of the way God intended for all things to operate. The church must be equipped to articulate and display the way of God as it relates to virtue ethics, physics, technology, that includes AI, biology, metaphysics, logic, poetry, theater, music, psychology, economics, politics, and government, and several other sciences. It's not about teaching people what God wants in this day, but we must teach them the how-tos. And that's what this conference is focused on. This season is not exclusively about teaching what the church must do again, but it's about how or the way things must be done. Ladies and gentlemen, this year's